Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, and we'll plan it. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. and the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. As, as we add 2 billion new people to the planet by 2050, how are we going to be able to provide the food, the fuel, the fiber, education, health care, infrastructure, all the things that are needed by these uh, new citizens, and at the same time, how we're going to be able to mediate and mitigate uh, the natural and more and more man-made disasters that are striking cities, countries, and local communities around the globe. I have a gentleman sitting right beside me. He's been here before. Uh, this is Dr. Linton. He goes by Lynn Wells II. He's a visiting distinguished research fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. And also he's a managing partner of Wells Analytics, LLC. And Lynn, welcome back to the Emerald Planet. Sam, it is great to be back. And uh, every time you come back, there's always exciting news, new technologies, new collaborations going on in your life. Tell us about star tides and then uh, tides itself. What do they mean and why this uh, intersect for collaboration, innovation, and technologies? So tides actually is a transformative innovation for development and emergency support. The basic premise is how do we provide, how do we help with sustainable support for populations under stress, post-disaster, post-war, impoverished. The origin of this was I spent almost 20 years in the Office of Secretary of Defense. And while there are lots of really interesting things you can do there, you get very stovepiped. And so uh, when I, I vowed if I ever got to a place where I could get beyond the stovepipes, I would try to pull them together into an integrated project. And NDU offers a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, well, let's pull up this uh, first slide. Uh, we want to uh, show this because I think this theme that you have here, post-disaster, post-war, impoverished, uh, this has real meaning, so if we can bring that slide up. Uh, looking at that, address what these three things really mean and how does it affect people on the ground? Well, let me do it in two parts. First of all, why is the Defense Department doing this? And the answer is that these three areas intersect with four main missions of the Department of Defense. One is post-war stability operations, stability and security. One is humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. One is building the capacity of partner nations, and then domestically we have something called defense support of civil authorities, which is defense, National Guard, supporting uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. Now looking at this, many people don't realize that the United States military is the largest humanitarian aid uh, delivery system on the planet. And so this really ties in with your star tides. So looking at the definitions of star tides and then this mission as far as the U.S. military, how does that really directly affect citizens on the ground, you know, around the globe in a way that really is a positive impact and effect on their lives. So Admiral Locklear, who is the commander of the Pacific Command, uh, last year made the comment that he saw climate change as being the activity that was most likely to upset the security environment in his region. And I think, for example, when you talk about water shortages, you really have to talk about the nexus of water and food and energy, because really they're all tied together. And so the differing integrated approaches of star tides, power, water, shelter, integrated combustion solar cooking, heating, cooling, lighting, sanitation, and lots of information communications technologies is designed to address kind of problems that will be kind of common to almost any region, any continent. Mm -hmm. Now looking at this, let's go right back, I want to go back to this, our goals. What yeah. are these goals? You've got three overlapping areas, so let's do the three by themselves and then where is the intersect among these three? So um, leveraging global talent, so TIDES is a Defense Department research project. We are funded by Defense Department uh, money. But because we are only a knowledge sharing project, we don't bend metal, we don't pick winners and losers among companies, our general counsel says we can maintain a network called the Star Tides Network mm -hmm. that lets us reach out and talk to almost anybody about anything. So that's what the leveraging global talent is. And the Star Tides Network is now about 4,000 different 
nodes from Northern Europe to Australasia. So we try to pull together the best ideas from everywhere. None of us has a, uh, has a monopoly on good ideas. Mm -hmm. The integrated approaches, I mentioned the eight infrastructures. So how do you do things like position the sanitation so it doesn't contaminate the water? and then use the heat generated by the cooking to pasteurize the water and maybe hook, uh, heat bricks and rocks to put in shelters so you can get heat at night without having fires in enclosed spaces. That's kind of the integrated approach. The sustained the private sector basically says, we're only interested in solutions that can be sustained by local populations in their worlds with their resources. Not interested in a bright shiny object that looks great out here on the U.S. display field and is inoperative six months after we deploy it. So how do we tie these things together? Leveraging global talent, none of us has all the good ideas. Integrated approaches, get things to work together and think of the needs of the local populations rather than what we think is a good idea. Looking at star tides <laughs> and then the, the tides itself, you've mentioned this uh, several times, but what is the actual differentiation between them? I know one is networking. Yeah, How does that lead to the other? So TIDES is a funded Defense Department research project. So we have to play by all the rules of defense in terms of accounting for funds and things like that. But so it's it, open and transparent. People know what's going on at, at all times, it is. in essence, it, yes. But it's also, again, a knowledge-sharing research project. So we don't actually build things. Mm -hmm. We don't do many field operations we observe sometimes. So that means we can use the Star Tides network to engage a much broader group of people than a normal Defense Department program might be able to. So uh, looking at that, as far as uh, leveraging the star tides, I know that you have this incredible network. You're the master of, of networking and also collaboration. So when you're looking around the globe, how do you, uh, you don't pick uh, losers and winners in this whole thing, but yet you're still looking for the best of the best. How do you go about that process? Is it through referral? Is it by interaction with people? Uh, you know, just how does that work? Well, so what happens is Tides is a place where people with problems and people with solutions can get together. And one of the best examples a couple of years ago was a Canadian general came by. And he said, mm, looks this very is interesting. This is field demonstration. That's a field demonstration, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting, but what have you got that works in minus 30 degrees, 30 knot winds, and permafrost? To which my answer was, I don't know. So we went out to the network, and within hours, people came back and said, well, I have a co contract with the government of the Yukon to work on green energy in Alaska, or in, in Canada. I have a contract with the Inuits to work on uh, projects in Alaska. And so we basically hooked them up with the Canadians, got out of the way. We're not trying to define the solution. We're trying to connect people with problems with people who can have solutions. And that's really the power of the network. So this TIDES project itself is not an intermediary. It's a, a sort of an arbitrage brokerage type mm -hmm. situation. It's like uh, Emerald Planet itself, where the last word in our motto is link. We're linking Absolutely. people all Absolutely. around the globe. And it's the same thing that uh, you're doing with that. So looking at the uh, collaboration, how do you foster and enhance uh, collaboration so that you, as you see things, things are coming in, but they're constantly advancing, becoming better, more refined, and again, reaching new audiences that maybe the people that developed the technology originally didn't even think about. So we, we put out a monthly newsletter. And increasingly, that's being repeated on other websites and other you know, like-minded organizations. So we're trying to grow the, you know, grow the interested contacts that way. Uh, and in addition, the people can come to the website and sign up. Mm -hmm. And if they have a particular project they'd like to work on, for example, during this week's demonstration at NDU, uh, we're, gonna, we're asking people to think about how you can protect workers in Ebola type situations. It's what are some really ways? something that's right. just really just almost burst on the scene around the globe. And so this question actually was just asked yesterday morning and uh, we hope to have an answer by you in about, about, you know, in about two days mm -hmm. to at least get back with here are some thoughts you might consider. Mm -hmm. Now looking at this, most people in today's world, they think technology is the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. And as we know, just like in medicine and even in sanitation, water, you know, not just only technician is the answer to that. So how do you go beyond the technology so that the human talent and all that really becomes a key component, but we're not just totally depending on technology? So the first thing you find in this is sociology always trumps technology. And so, I'll repeat that, that's a good statement. Sociology will always trump technology. Okay, got it. So for starters, we tried to look at building social networks and developing trust ahead of time. Mm -hmm. As someone said, the worst time to exchange business cards is after the disaster. So how do you build those networks? 
Second of all, often the policy and doctrine is pretty good, but the people on the ground don't know what they can cannot do. Right. So how do you inform them about what the linkage is? There's a question about legal regimes. So Defense Department is not in the foreign aid business. If we leave, say, a water purification kit behind, have we violated some kind of foreign aid law? How do you get stuff through customs? Obviously, you need resources. Mm -hmm. But the really key piece is that no lesson is ever learned until behavior changes. You can observe a lesson, come back next year, reobserve the same lesson. So how do you train, exercise, educate, I'd say incentivize, to cause people to do things differently so a lesson can really be learned? Mm -hmm. Now looking at this whole thing about the uh, education, I know education is a key component of everything you've done in your life, you know, a few de decades there. And so uh, taking that and leveraging it into, you know, this mission areas, I know that you actually weave this through everything. So you have the mission areas, and then again, you're putting the education and you want to see this change as far as behaviors. How do you make sure that's actually happening in a place like in Afghanistan or Ghana or, you know, any place where, where you're going and working in these hostile environments in many cases? So one of the things that the research component that the National Defense University is trying to do is to move to a continuous lifelong learning environment. Right now, Defense Department typically divides uh, its learning into training and then experiential learning on the job training and then education. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the explosion of opportunity of education going, uh, going on in private sector adult education, how do we apply that to not only the TIES mission but national defense in general? So the goal would be to move to a continuous lifelong learning supported by point of need content delivery. So this is you know, advanced distributed learning, it's virtual worlds, it's things like that. Mm -hmm. And the technology exists to do it, now how do we put it together into an educational system, learning system that gets us there. Well, looking at FEMA, this is something that we don't really think about, but you know, it's very much a part of what you're doing. And uh, even though we think about it as being purely American, it really has global reach. How does FEMA fit into all this? Well, FEMA is uh, you know, a, a core partner in all of the things we've tried to do. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's the Defense Support of Civil Authorities mission I mentioned, which is uh, working with the governors and with FEMA and with the uh, uh, local uh, organizations. Organizations. Certainly with regard to Sandy and things like that and the national exercise they've done over a year, we work really closely with FEMA. Well, so. we've just about run out of time, which is always the case when we're with uh, Dr. Lynn Wells, who is a visiting distinguished research fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies, National Defense University, and managing partner of Wells Analytics. And thank you for being with us. We look at this topic of how we're going to meet the needs of two billion new people as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. There's more than just books at the library. There's more than just books at the library. Excuse me. There's more than just books at the library. de livres à la bibliothèque. Hello. You have a lot of great books here today. You know there's more than just books at the library. I know. There's more than just books at the library. I don't want to be hooked to a machine. I want all the medical treatment available to me. I wouldn't want my family to have to make this decision. My doctor knows what's best for me. An advanced directive is your life on your terms. Talk with your family. Decide what's right for you. Then put it in writing. Documenting my wishes today means my family won't have to make heart-wrenching decisions later. To learn more, visit www.putitinwriting.org. 1,200 American youth run away from their homes every day. The National Runaway Switchboard is here to help. 1-800-RUNAWAY. If you are a runaway, thinking about running away from home, or a parent or guardian concerned about issues facing your child, call us 24 hours a day. 1-800-RUNAWAY. In times of crisis, hope 
is just a phone call away. 1-800- to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we're looking for what we call the best of the best, the thousand best practices to meet the needs of an emerging population on the planet that's growing to nine billion souls by 2050. And at the same time, when we're adding two billion new people, we're going to be adding almost 300 megacities, which are uh, over 20 million people. Some of these cities already exist, some that actually expand over three different countries in the Horn of Africa. So how we're going to be able to take care of all these new people at the same time to provide their needs when there's a potential for uh, category six to eight earthquakes under about 195 of these 300 main cities. We have a gentleman sitting right beside us is trying to figure all this out at the same time to set up the networks that's going to be addressing uh, these various issues. This is David C. Becker. He is a director of what's called the Civil Military Activity Integration, and we'll talk about that, David, in a minute, Center for Technology and National Security Policy at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Uh, I hope they pay you on the, the length of your title, David. <laughs> I asked for a raise, but it didn't seem to work It didn't out. seem to work, but I tell you, that's, that's a lot to carry around. But anyway, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what it is you're doing in this whole civil military, this integration of all this. And, you know, because people think of these as being mutually exclusive. They're right. really not. Uh, very much so. In fact, uh, when you look at what we're trying to do, the military, and certainly the U.S. military, has spent 10 years, if you will, in Iraq and Afghanistan realizing or having to work with the fact that the sort of conflict that they've been in is a conflict where they really need to bring the population to their side. So there's been a lot of focus on that recently mm -hmm. over the last 10 years, and they really want to see what it is that they can do to improve their ability to talk to populations and improve their ability then to in some cases is understand what the populations are going through and understand what it is that is most useful for them. So that applies whether you're in a conflict situation or whether you're in a disaster situation. Same situation applies or the same difficulties apply in both cases. Now looking at the Star Tides network, I know this is global, there's some 4,000 involved and all that. Uh, we have a few of the logos back here, but this is really almost goes out into infinity as far as the people that you're working with and the collaboration. In Star Tides, how does collaboration and then the sustainability all interact and, and it's part of the core of what it is that you're really doing through Star Tides Network? Yeah. Well, it became pretty clear that the Department of Defense doesn't have all the answers, nor do any of many of the other organizations that are out there, but they all have some part of the answers. The issue then is how do you connect these people together in such a way that they can talk to each other more efficiently and start to exchange their experiences. Now that's true for the organizations, but even if you're talking about the populations that are affected in the disasters, it's very much a question of how do you listen to them or how do you deliver something that is useful to them. So again, that's the collaboration that you're talking about there. And the more that you do that and the more that you talk to the local population, the better you're going to be probably in coming up with sustainable solutions, solutions that will in fact last for a long time and not just for the period of time that you as a responding organization is there. You want this to go on much further. Mm -hmm. Looking at the cloud, this is something that people, this amorphous thing they call the cloud, it's like, you know, somewhere, you know, in the clouds, uh, somewhere in the universe. Uh, but yet it's very much a uh, Earth-based uh, uh, activity and, and location. What is the crowd, uh, cloud? And then uh, what do you do as far as this uh, crowdsourcing, bringing people into the process so that when you're delivering a service, it's something that they truly want? Uh, very, oh, exactly. Well, we're, we're, among other things, what we're trying to do, we're dealing with some of the organizations that we work with, is how do you connect them more effectively, of course. Uh, but, but sometimes we have questions. We, we don't know the answer. And we can literally put out a question to the entire network and say, what do you know about that? For instance, right now, we're doing something on Ebola. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting asked some questions about, is, are there technologies that we can use here? Are there some sorts of solutions that we would bring up? 
and we're putting that question out to as many people as possible to see what they may have as a suggestion. Again, we don't have all the answers, neither does anybody else in particular, and the more we can do that, the more interchange we're likely to have. Now looking at this uh, post-disaster, one is, uh, we know post-disaster is that you're out there trying to help people, uh, but we really look at it is that you're really looking at it before the disaster strikes to bring in the resources that people need to allow them to be uh, evolving and developing their own communities. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that so that we're actually doing things in advance, not waiting till there's a disaster? It's just like Dr. Lynn Wells, you know, the gentleman that you, know, you work with on an ongoing basis at NDU, he says it doesn't help to have the business card after the disaster. You need it well before. Right. So how do we tie all this together so we actually be getting the solutions before there's a disaster? Ideally, you want people to pay attention before there's a disaster so that they are, in fact, prepared for it. That's the hardest part, of course, because it hasn't happened yet. You've got many other things that you're worried about. Nothing really to focus on. Exactly, and it doesn't matter whether you're living in New York City before Hurricane Sandy hits or whether you're living in the Philippines before another hurricane hits and suddenly you've got the same issues whether you're living in a hut that is washed away or, you know, you've got a house in the Rockaways that is washed away. So how do you get that sort of attention? Again, that's part of what we're working at with the network and certainly the Department of Defense plays a role here because ultimately if other organizations are unable to respond effectively, then the Department of Defense is, ends up being the last line in order to be able to provide assistance, which is exactly what is happening with Apple right now as well, because you'll notice that the regular civilian organizations tried to do what they needed to do, but they needed more logistics to support more people. So again, that's the sort of thing that we're trying to, to emphasize as much as possible. And uh, that's why you will see perhaps a big upfront effort, but then longer term development efforts go out for much longer. Yeah. Looking at sustainability, uh, this is really a buzzword. How would you, through star tides and tides, define what sustainability, resiliency, I'm going to throw that in there, uh, really means? And then how does the solutions this network then become involved in order to, so it is sustainable, which is falling back on the, the answer to the last question? That's always very hard. Uh, the, the fact is, is that a sustainable solution is one that the local population will find useful for the long term. They will find useful enough that they will continue to invest their efforts in maintaining it. Uh, that means you have to listen very, very closely in order to be able to see, okay, what we're offering is, it looks good to us, but is it really good for them? And if you can't get them to really buy into it, and that's the sort of thing where you're trying to offer them some service or offer them perhaps, in fact, computer technology if you're in Afghanistan, and as one example there, things like that, you have to figure out what it is that will really work for them and give them an opportunity to say, yeah, we want that and we want that enough that we'll continue to support this in the future. That's where you really have to be listening. And some of these organizations are very good at that, uh, much better than the Department of Defense is, which is fine. That's not what we're there for. We're there to support others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking at this, just like with the uh, computing, uh, telecommunications, cell phone connections and all that, how do we actually bring that to peoples that you know, really are trying to leap time. They didn't really have that hardwired infrastructure in place, you know, ever in most cases. And all of a sudden, we're now bringing this in to them, but we're now doing it, you know, wirelessly using the cloud, all these new technologies to make sure that it actually will work into more classical or traditional cultures. Ideally, we'll do this through the private sector, which is to say it will be something that's sustainable because it is a business in such a way that they will continue to be able to support themselves in the future. Um, Myanmar, or Burma, um, is going through a very interesting experiment, just like you're talking about. For the longest time, they had virtually no telephone service at all. They have liberalized in such a way that now there's about six million um, Burmese that now have telephones, but they're figuring that they're going to reach 60 million in the next four years. That's incredible growth. Which is a complete jump. Right. And they will have, as well, they will probably have Wi-Fi, which will say they will have internet access. And these are not just cell phones, they're really smartphones. Mm -hmm. Everybody will be carrying a smartphone. Very amazing. It will be very interesting to see what really happens when suddenly everybody is carrying around a smartphone in the same country at the same time. And they just skipped all the intervening generations of technology. 
Now looking at this, this is in Afghanistan, and of course the same thing is going on here. If you look at uh, all the solar panels and the telecommunications, the backhaul to the satellite, you know, all these technologies that we're looking at right in the slide, how do you maintain it? I know we're talking about private sector, governments involved, but how do the local populations go about being able to maintain this, but not just maintain, to enhance, grow, and and to uh, take to the next generation something that's even better than what's being brought in now. Again, it really requires relying on the local population. Uh, you can't do this without their support. Uh, the Afghan case is a very good case as far as that goes because frankly these are in very conflicted zones. If they're not willing to keep this equipment and maintain it themselves, nobody else is going to be able to get in and do it. And in addition to which, there's always a concern that somebody else will come along and destroy it for their own po political reasons. So you really want the population to be very committed to it. And in this case, in these particular locations where um, some of our uh, affiliates have been working, that's exactly what's happening. They are maintaining these things themselves. This is not rich. This is not uh, high tech in the way we would understand high tech. These are very simple, uh, but one way or another, they make it happen. Now, looking at the uh, educational component of this, you're talking about here, David, and that you want to go in and be able to maintain what's going on here, but that really boils down to education, and the education needs to be sustainable. In conflict zones and extreme disaster zones, how do you keep that continuity of the education and, again, the constant enhancement of the technology itself so it does not get dated, and then it just, again, they're just passed on. That's a sort of a whole nother slice of what we're talking about. Once you deliver the technology, how are you going to keep that going and what you're trying to get out of it? Uh, the education there, again, relies largely on some of the organizations that we're working with. They work very hard in order to make that happen. Uh, but again, it's a matter of what we in, a, what in the Department of Defense, they frequently call training the trainer. And again, the Afghan case is a very good example because at a certain point, uh, the last picture that we had up there, those were actually people, and those particular photos were of people who had been trained by Afghans who had first been trained by U.S. Uh, people. So the uh, U.S. trainers trained these, and then these went out into the neighborhoods or out into the villages and were able to do that as well. So they're already starting that continuous cycle, which is exactly what you want to see. David, we're uh, flat out of time. I'm going to leave the slide up because I love this. What do you see for the next 5 to 15 years for Star Tides and Tides? Uh, We've got to be quick. We keep trying to uh, grow the network. Um, it, we were saying that it was about 1,500. Now it's 3,000. We're going higher than that. We want to keep on increasing the number of people who are involved. Yeah, it's fantastic. David C. Becker is with us. He's the director of the Civil Military Activity Integration Project, the Center for Technology and National Security Policy at National Defense University. And thank you for being with us as we look at all these technologies and disaster zones as we create the Emerald Planet. Some of Bin Laden calls getting the nuclear weapons a religious duty. Today, materials that can be used to make nuclear weapons are stored in more than 40 countries. Sometimes protected by just a chain link fence. Yet not enough is being done to lock down these materials before terrorists steal them. Why did we learn all this? My mother, my son, my sister-in-law were all murdered September 11th. Help protect America. Together we can. Please join us. The stem cell issue is being debated throughout the country. Truth is, most everyone has an opinion, even if they don't know the facts. Let's stop arguing and start really understanding the potential of stem cell research. For us and for millions of Americans living with disabilities, get the facts. Call 1-877-842-3442 for free information from the Stem Cell Research Foundation. That's 1-877-842-3442. Following the tragic events of September 11th, there have been hundreds of violent attacks against innocent Americans. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. Remember, please stop the hate. We're stronger when we are united. Remember. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. One nation under God. And invisible. With liberty. And justice. For all. In America, there's either room for everyone, or it's not America. Don't pick the wrong fight. Let's keep America land of the free. Stop the hate. Planning a home renovation? Put this at the top of your to-do list. Because after 10 years, none of you are protected against tetanus and another potentially fatal disease, diphtheria.
A minor injury, such as a cut or a scrape, can put you at risk for a tetanus infection. And while safety gear offers some protection, an up-to-date vaccination called the TD Booster is the best insurance against tetanus. So get the TD Booster. If it's been 10, do it again. Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet. We'll be coming to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States, looking around the globe for those thousand best practices, the places that around the globe that are actually dealing with uh, rapid population growth and at the same time may be in conflict zones and or facing natural or man-made disasters. So how are we going to take care of all these people as we go to a planet with 9 billion souls by 2050 and maybe 12 to 13 billion by the end of the 21st century? We have a gentleman who actually is uh, aggressively working in this area. Uh, joining us, this is uh, Dr. Peter M. Uh, Kilcommons. He's the CEO of MedWeb and also he has his own uh, nonprofit. And uh, Pete, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, sir. You've been doing good work, and we hear lots of good things about you and what you're doing. And uh, the slides we're going to be sharing really talks about uh, some of these things and images. But uh, tell us a little bit about your work as far as what, what is MedWeb, and then also about your nonprofit activities. Well, thank you. Uh, MedWeb is a, a telemedicine and uh, radiology and picture archiving and communications company. So we specialize uh, in particular in uh, providing medical informatics solutions and telemedicine in austere environments or under, underserved environments and uh, all over the world. Well, looking at the, the work that you're doing as far as the uh, MedWeb is concerned, uh, as we add 2 billion people, I mean, this is just incredible to think about it, and that's just a few years ahead of us. How, you know, people are struggling now to keep up. How do we use all the tools of modern society, this innovation, the collaboration, invention, so that we're able to actually enhance the quality of life and not just trying to sustain people? Well, it's, it's an exceptional question, and it's a really uh, an excellent time in, in uh, human history to, to live and to see these transformative processes that are now uh, made available. MedWeb has been working in particular on uh, mobile uh, applications that run in all different sorts of smartphones and feature phones and simple phones uh, in cellular networks. And uh, what, it, what it allows us to do uh, uh, across the world is for physicians to share the resources and knowledge uh, across geography and borders. Now, leaving, I'm going to leave this slide up here because I think this is uh, very instructive. But, you know, we're talking about all these advanced technologies, but yet we're dealing in, in many areas around the globe which are uh, based on very traditional societies. Uh, they don't come easily to change. It's very expensive in many areas uh, to bring change in there. So how do we balance that so that actually people are willing to embrace these new technologies, feel like it's meeting their needs, at a time when there's, in a sense, almost more resistance to the changes going on because society has got to catch up with the technology and that's a difficult uh, bridge to cross. It's, it's a, a fascinating question and uh, one that I got to learn a lot about firsthand in our various uh, efforts around the world. In particular, uh, every process we, we make it a collaboration between the local physicians and local healthcare architecture. And uh, we generally use uh, cell phone technology over and above uh, traditional PCs and, and laptops because it's considerably more mobile, it's cost effective in every environment and works very well. Well, I know that you've been working out in California with a place called Camp Roberts. So if you can explain what Camp Roberts is, because uh, most of the people will have no idea, even the Americans that are with us. But how is this a place where you go in and you're just, it's almost like a giant playground for technologies and you're able to finesse and to refine ideas, technologies, products, services, so then this in turn can go back out to the world and hopefully do good things. Camp Roberts is an absolutely wonderful playground for uh, collaboration and integration 
uh, by all different sorts of uh, uh, players, whether they're technology or humanitarian aid organizations. Uh, the idea is to uh, collaborate in this, this large campus that the federal government has, just rolling hills and tarantulas and trees uh, is pretty much all you got out there. But what it does allow us to do is to try out our technologies and in particular try out integration of those technologies and learn from each other. And uh, that's a, a wonderful component of the, the TIDES program. Now, looking at the, uh, the TIDE, what is TIDES and, and you being in the, the private sector, even though you're doing a public good and a great humanitarian work, you're still a, a for-profit business. We're still a business. business. Absolutely. And yeah. so through TIDES, how does that leverage what you're trying to do as a private business? And then how does that fold back into you know, what the, the NGOs and the non, uh, non-governmental organizations are trying to do? Well, I think we all, there's two, two really important components to this. One is we all have our own ideas of what might be a superb solution in uh, a different types of disaster response environments or developing world environments. Would, uh, however, barring the, uh, going to that environment and testing your solution out, being able to go to a TIDES uh, uh, you know, relief exercise at Camp Roberts allows us to evolve our ideas about how these things integrate, perhaps you know, recognize what works, what doesn't work, well before we hit a natural disaster and we go out and try it out in the real world. Now looking at this, uh, this I think is uh, maybe an operating theater or uh, maybe a nerve center for a, a type of uh, medical uh, center. And it's almost like every year there's, there's this new crisis that just rolls around the earth. We get through that one. As soon as we catch our breath, here's the next one you know, coming upon us. So in a place like this that we're looking at right here, it looks very chaotic. At the same time, it's uh, very organized. So how do we use this in order to be able to extrapolate to you know, the next crisis that's coming upon us? So what you're looking at is actually a meeting being held at uh, the relief exercise in Camp Roberts. And uh, what was fun and and, uh, awesome about this was that we had people from Red Cross, from uh, various NGO organizations, from the government, from private sector, all sitting around a table and and going over, well, how did this part or that part of our experiment work out? Because when we go to relief, we're basically uh, mapping our solution sets around uh, some sort of an exercise that's you know, agreed on in advance. So it could be a, uh, a natural disaster, it could be some other type of thing. Uh, but, but when we uh, got together around the table and you start to get feedback from each of these different participants and it, you walk away with uh, a thousand more ideas of how you could do better the next time. And then these iter- iterative events uh, at Camp Roberts and uh, uh, end up evolving technologies that much more rapidly and also generating an awareness or cross-pollinization across these different enterprises because without something like Star Tides and, and the Tides program, there are a few opportunities for uh, various NGOs and, and, and private company innovators like myself and, and uh, government services to get together and experiment with these things uh, in a uh, non-urgent environment. And of course we know when when we're in an urgent environment, the last thing anyone wants to do is experiment with a new technology or look for a new solution. Yeah, you're looking for how do we take care of this. But looking at this situation right here, how then do we institutionalize all this knowledge that's being gained so that when you go out into real life situation as we're looking at here, you know, things actually happen. But then at the same time, we have to have a feedback loop, I would assume, in all of this. So how do you go out, you know, meet the immediate need, but still have a continuous feedback loop as if you're at a Camp Roberts? You've got real human beings that really are facing a dire situation. Well, uh, uh, the photographs that you're looking at, there, uh, some are from the, the desert in Nevada, and some are from actually uh, uh, southeastern Afghanistan, and uh, my my collaborators in southeastern Afghanistan were the gentleman there and a bunch of sheep, and then in the Nevada desert it was a little bit different scenario. But uh, the iterative but again, we're talking about the juxtaposition of this feedback loop. You know, regardless of where you are and how that works, and we're constantly improving the system itself. 
So the, the important component of this is that you establish collaborative relationships and you can maintain them. And then as we evolve the product, then our collaborators, for example, in Afghanistan, the doctors in uh, Jalalabad or Kabul, are, are now participants in the process. So essentially they've joined in that Star Tides uh, communication loop, and that has caused uh, s several iterations of the products to perform that much more. Bit, more. Yeah, yeah, and facility. I know, and I know that uh, through the uh, star tides and the uh, what they call the uh, field day demonstrations and all that that we're looking at right here. How then can you bring in, and how many different uh, groups are you trying to bring together at one time that you really need to depend on, so that w when you're out in Afghanistan or you're in a Uganda, wherever it may be around the globe, that you can literally uh, get on the cell phone or send an email and somebody's going to respond to you in something that's in a positive way that's going to impact the people that you're actually dealing with in the field. Uh, again, that, that collaborative network that comes from Start Tides, although it's an informal network, uh, you create uh, friendships instead of a formal relationship and, oh, I, this is what I generate. It's more of a couple of uh, colleagues getting together and experimenting together. And it, cha it changes the whole dynamic of how we collaborate. So when there is an urgent uh, event, uh, it's instant. You'll start getting phone calls from the guys you met through Star Tides or out on the, the parade field at NDU. And uh, we work together quite, quite easily. Uh, finding what is the best solution to to uh, address the, the situation, who has the most resources or availability. Yeah, Pete, you were talking about NDU, National Defense University. How does that serve as a backbone to all these things that we're talking about right here for both star tides and tides? Well, uh, a lot of people uh, don't realize that the Department of Defense has two primary missions, uh, certainly defense. And the second mission, uh, which became part of their prime directive, I forgot how many years ago, but it was a wonderful thing, was response to natural, natural disasters, man-made disasters, humanitarian aid. And so a significant amount of effort goes into that. Uh, and uh, we were invited into this on, strictly on the the notion that how can we develop better communications between civilians and military when responding to national, uh, natural disasters uh, and work more closely together to, to help people. The uh, information communications technologies, I know that this is what you've been talking about and it seems to be one of those core areas that you have to have. And uh, through the uh, Camp Roberts and then actually being in the field, what kinds of refinements are you finding that you then can take back to people who are collaborating with you that's supposed to be providing you know, these advanced technologies? Well, the, the timing of your question matches that slide. If we can go back a slide even. Uh, the, no, forward one. So the, the uh, stand you see there is a 100 and watt this solar. this has got to be quick because we're about out of time. It's a 100 watt solar panel running a cell phone network that uh, you can stand up in a few minutes. Uh, our experience from Hurricane Katrina and subsequent natural disasters, plus various development disasters, showed us that having a simple, easy to use communications network we could stand up would be very helpful. And these, all these things here are very important too. This is Dr. Peter M. Kilcommons. He's the CEO of MedWeb, has his own uh, international uh, nonprofit working around the globe with uh, tides and star tides, which is very important. Thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. This is FirstGov.gov, where we're obsessed with getting you government information. Brand new student loan applications on the site, baby. This calls for a celebration. Here's your uncle. So in the end, it was either take the astronaut gig or come work here. What can I say? Duty call. Dude, that's my cop. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure that's Sam's cop. Oh, sorry? Yeah. No. Sam's? No. Just log on or email us and get what you need. C, change of address form. That's how it's done. D, driver's license renewal. No. E, uh, e. Uh, emailing social security information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice, we'll allow it. Mm. All right, Ed. What are those? Government surplus cars for auction. You posted those online last time. No, you did. I'm posting them online this time. For all your government information, firstgov.gov. Oh, what have we got here? Sometimes you feel tired. You can't seem to lose those extra pounds off your midsection. Your joints hurt when you take the stairs. Well, you're getting older. 
but I'm happy to say that there's some simple things we can do to keep you happy and healthy for years to come. We can also lower your risk for some serious diseases the older population is often subject to. Proper nutrition is more important than ever. Your body has changed, you know, not as many treats. Basic exercise plan, lots of walks and fresh air, and most importantly, come and see me for twice yearly checkup to help ensure that the best possible quality of life. Now, how does that sound? <laughs> Good boy. Improve the quality of life for your elderly pet. Schedule twice yearly checkup that include preventive care and regular lab work. The message from the veterinary members of the American Animal Hospital Association. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet and Director and Host of Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis looking around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And at the same time, we see ourselves as the link, and just as the gentleman sitting right beside me, is that to bring people together, the people, the citizens within local communities, and all the resources that we need. But at the same time we're doing that, we're trying to expand and enhance the technologies, the services, and the products, because we're adding two billion new people to the planet by 2050. And so I have three gentlemen here. They're going to be talking about uh, some of these uh, aspects. Uh, Dr. Linton uh, Wells, the second. He is the managing partner of uh, Wells Analytics, LLC, and a visiting distinguished uh, research fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. Right beside him is David C. Becker, the director of Civil Military Activity Integration, the Center for Technology and National Security Policy. Lynn, all these long titles. My <laughs> gosh, you got to get by on that. Uh, National Defense University. And then at the very end, uh, Dr. Pete M. Kilcommons, the CEO of uh, MedWeb. And gentlemen, welcome to the Emerald Planet at TV. Sam, it's good to be here. Good to, be here. Glad to have you. And uh, Lynn, uh, it's good to always have you back. And uh, it's just it's just amazing the change. You know, we're together you know, at least a, every year on Emerald Planet, and it's just like it's it's a whole new fresh world out there with what you're doing. But talking about uh, star tides and, and tides, uh, and what are the three things that you find through this innovation, collaboration, and new uh, inventions that are making a difference as we are moving towards 2050 and a planet with nine billion people? I think the first thing is you've got to leverage global talent. None of us has all the answers. And so, as someone once said, in this environment, the only unforgivable sin is hubris to say, my way is the only way. So we try to reach out and gather a bunch of people together. The second is to recognize the solutions only work if they are sustainable by local populations and their worlds or their resources. So don't look for bright, shiny objects that look good in U.S. display fields. Think of what the in situ conditions would be. And the third is to recognize that sociology will always trump technology. It's, uh, you can have the best things in the world if you haven't built the social networks, developed the trust, you're not going to get them to work. Uh, looking at, David, the work you're doing, this uh, intersect between civil society development, but yet it's still a very robust uh, military. And But we're looking at the military that actually has a very large humanitarian aid component going in for both man-made and natural disasters. Uh, what are some of the things that we need to look at so that the citizens really believe we're there to help? And at the same time, we have a feedback loop so that they're actually helping the next people who are going to be standing in harm's way, whatever that harm's way may be. I think one of the things that the uh, U.S. military, at least, has learned over the last decade or so is that they really have to focus on the population. Whether you're involved in Iraq, Afghanistan, or a major disaster somewhere, it always comes back to what is the population actually going to be able to do for itself, and how can you help the population actually do that? So if you can somehow or another push that 
closer together. And a lot of what we've seen recently with new technologies, whether it's something like Facebook or other sorts of communications technologies, is the fact that citizens are more capable of self-organizing as groups, as organizations now. And so our goal, as much as anything, is to try and bring those organizations into contact with the military so the military knows how to actually work with those. And of course, the, this is really goes to what they call the hearts and minds of people within local communities. It's uh, very, very important. And we have uh, two gentlemen here with National Defense University, very much involved in the evolution of what's called star tides and the global network. Uh, but Pete, with your organization, you are a private company, the MedWeb. Uh, yet you still, in many ways, operate as a humanitarian aid organization with uh, medical and, and all these other types of uh, technologies. But you've been very much involved at a place called Camp Roberts, which is out in California. It's a large uh, playground, in a sense, for new technologies and uh, innovation. So looking at this uh, relief organization and interaction with a number of government agents, uh, NGOs, and private businesses. What are some of the things that you're learning to prepare for future disasters, whether nature or man-made? And as you know, more and more, it's man-made disasters that we're actually responding to. I think uh, the most important thing that, that we get out of it, uh, you know, as, as a private company, we have a, a double bottom line. We're looking for, certainly we have to make money, but we also uh, want to do good in the world. and. And we see uh, the star tides and relief exercises as an incredible resource to learn how to collaborate, how to be helpful, and how to interoperate with all these other organizations and, and agencies, whether they're you know the Red Cross or non-government or or the DoD. Yeah, looking at Lynn at what you're doing, I know that uh, this is it's really a response. It's demand driven in many ways, but I know the, the wisdom that you have for this organization over the years that I've gotten to know you, that you keep saying we have to be looking beyond just the immediate. We have to be looking to the future. We need to be planning for that future, even though we may not know what it is out there. So using the Star Tides and, and the Tides organization that you've helped to develop over the years, how are we actually trying to avoid some of these natural disasters in the future, and even these internally displaced persons through conflict that is going on across the globe, and the um, health disasters like an Ebola or SARS and, and uh, MERS and all these others. How do we look beyond the horizon so that we're anticipating and we're planning and we're not just always constantly spending a lot of money trying to respond to disaster? So the Philippines had a really excellent conference a few years ago called Engineering for Resilience. And they looked at a disaster, typhoon had come through, flooded a lot of places. And then between that and the time the conference was held, the earthquakes in Haiti and Chile had been held. And so it happened. So they realized that in the future, they're going to need to be uh, not just reactive, but how do you engineer resilience? How do you anticipate and mitigate? Now, of course, in a natural disaster, you can't necessarily avoid it. That's what nature brings you. But you can be less vulnerable to, and so by looking at you know, your climate change models, by looking at your enforcement of things like building codes, by looking at the extent to which feeder streams and runoff areas have been paved over, you can do a lot to, uh, to try to make the damage you know, less severe than might otherwise have been. Mm -hmm. The other thing is just building back better. Uh, with the World Bank had a conference a couple of weeks ago on world reconstruction. The point was don't just build back the way you had it before. Try to anticipate not building back in the same floodplain, things like that. Yeah, this is going to just like a Port-au-Prince, uh, Haiti, where you had this uh, earthquake and you had a city that was literally built for about 150,000 people, but it just happened to have 2.7 million residing there. And so how do you actually create a, a city new instead of saying, hey, we're going to rebuild? It's, it's really way beyond that. And David, that goes to really a kind of uh, gives you a, a jump start in the question we have for you as far as the civilian military activity and uh, this, the integration. Uh, how do we actually look again so that we're avoiding many of these natural disasters? Are we really learning from the past, really learning from history to anticipate? Or are we so caught up in responding to all of these natural disasters and, and the conflict zones that we really don't have time to do that? 
Well, I'll tell you, the military, for one thing, I mean, although you think that they're there to, to, you know, be ready to fight, which certainly they are, the other thing that they obviously think a lot about is how to avoid conflict in the first place. What needs to be done in order to avoid that happening? And if you look at the development world, in some senses, that is the same thing that they are doing. They are trying to avoid conflict by using development tools in order to get there. Uh, certainly in order to improve the lives of people. There is actually a lot of crossover between these two particular worlds. And what we're trying to do as much as anything is encourage those things that may be of use from the military side might be useful in the development world. There may be technologies in the development world that would be useful to the military. So that as much as possible you're getting this sort of cross-feeding which allows you to build something larger and hopefully have more impact. Yeah, before we go to Pete and uh, talk about some of the things that he's been doing out there in the, uh, the private sector, going back to what you are just saying, David, how do we actually institutionalize? Do we have institutional memory of all the things that have gone before? Uh, these are both the one the things that have been planned for, you know, the experiments we're doing, and then look at the disasters we've been able to respond to so that it's smoother, better, more efficient, and maybe less use of you know, money, materials, uh, machines in order to respond so that we're getting more resources from the local communities and not having to transport right. everything into it, which is a huge expense. Well, Lynn often refers to the fact that uh, the issue is not so much lessons observed, which is to say you see what has happened and you say, well, we shouldn't do that again, but lessons learned where you actually do something about making sure it doesn't happen again. The second idea, of course, is much, much harder than just reporting on it in the newspaper and then saying tut tut and going on with it. Uh, as much as anything, uh, a lot of what we've been doing is trying to drive home what is positive, what are the best practices, exactly what it is that people should be thinking about as they make the decisions that they have to make. That is very hard. Uh, there's a number of organizations in the uh, StarTides network, actually, that work very, very hard at this sort of thing, and they have best practices that we like to bring out and highlight for others so that not everybody has to go through the same repeated learning process again and again. Pete, I'm gonna, this is a quick question because I want to end up with Lynn because he's the senior amongst us here, so we always end up with Lynn. But public-private partnerships, how do, how do they uh, allow us to again get to beyond the horizon at the same time be able to respond in a very efficient and effective manner. And we got about 30 seconds to do all that. In a, in a nutshell, I think private industry has the ability to evolve technologies much more rapidly than might happen on the public side. However, the public side is where the need is and also where the knowledge of prior experience uh, comes into play. So public-private partnerships are a really nice melding of the two that get us to, uh, uh, as you pointed out, develop new technologies and approaches so we're more resilient for the next disaster. Lynn, uh, we're going to go out with you. We have about 25 seconds. What do you see not only for star tides and tides, but also other institutions that can contribute to where we need to be in 2050? Well, I think the key is information sharing. We've got to be more transparent. We've got to reach out and engage with each other. Synergy, uh, collaboration, transparency. Anyway, thank you for being with us. This is Dr. Lynn Wells. Uh, David, I'm going to reach across, thank shake you your much. hand. Uh, Pete, I'm going to wave to you down there, but thank you for being with us. And thank you for flying all the way from California out here to be here. And thank you, uh, dear viewers, for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet.